I'm in Malibu, California today at the Pepperdine University. I'm at the Frederick Wiseman Museum of Art. I'm visiting the Richard Diebenkorn exhibit called Beginnings, 1942 to 1955. This is the first gallery of two galleries in the exhibit here at Malibu. And I'm going to put out some uh, rules out here. I'm not going to say the names of the paintings or the years of the painting. Most of the paintings are called Untitled and uh, it just distracts, it makes it too analytical. So I'm going to skip that and just talk about my opinions of the paintings. Here's one of the first walls and one of the things I noticed is that in these paintings there are kind of really sharp edges to him. He was using that a lot and um, it's one significant style he used at this point of the, his career. Here's another painting and one thing I want to say about these paintings is that there's many layers on these and when you, when you're, you can see the texture when you're actually here and you can see how the, um, many layers he developed to create the painting and that changes later on. Here's one of the early wash drawings or paintings and just looking at the um, the way he set it up here and you can see the kind of the pools of wash that developed and he just leaves that and I like this part of the painting where he put down uh, the orange over the burgundy color and he just, um, it started, after he put it down, it was still very wet and he, uh, it started to slip away from the background in the burgundy and um, it's just slipping down the picture and he just let it happen. He just, he didn't try to fix it. He just, it, it shows how he, when he's painting a picture, he, um, allows the accidents that occur in a painting to become part of the picture. So it's a way of being in control, but not being in control. And um, I think that is a principle that he believed in. When I look at this painting, I think about the colors, which to me it's more colors of the Western United States where it's uh, often dry and they're just bright oranges. And at the top corner here, it's kind of got a pinkish color that goes well with the orange. In this painting, I was looking at it closely and I looked at the top left corner and I found a profile of a, the, a dog. And I've read about these abstracts and expressionist painters where sometimes you're just intuitively going through a picture and you create a Mickey Mouse ear or in this case, the side of a dog. And a lot of times they erase that out and fix it and remove it. But in this case, I'm pretty sure he knew what he was doing and he left it in there. And uh, Diebenkorn did have a dog who was in his studio a lot of the time, so.
I think, in my opinion, this was on purpose. It's kind of funny. Great painters that I've noticed, they reinvent drawing, they reinvent color, they reinvent composition. And Dibbon Korn is definitely someone who did that. His, all of those parts of his paintings are unique. And I read a quote from Frank Stella when he was painting and he said he found a problem with painting and that they didn't use the corners. You know, there's usually a subject in the middle of a painting and then you look at the subject and then you and then the corners are empty and nothing's happening. And he wanted to do all over painting. He wanted to cover all the corners of the painting. And I definitely think that's what Deben Korn was doing. He's actually avoiding a subject in the painting. Now back to this painting with the Indian red on the bottom half. I noticed that this is kind of a landscape layout of the painting. And then in the next painting, the almost you see on the wall, is he's turned that on its side, but he's turned it on its side and he's challenging himself to go from a landscape layout to a profile layout. And it just, I know that from reading his stuff that he, he really liked to challenge himself and not get stuck in a rut. Uh, so this is just demonstrates what he was uh, trying to do. Now I wanted to point out the variety of marks that he makes on the image, both with a thick brush and a thin brush and maybe a reed pen or something. But um, you can see here, it kind of looks like he splashed the, the black mark on the right. It doesn't not necessarily the same diameter as the other black mark. The red mark is very thick and kind of very purposely done aggressively. Then you have this X mark with kind of a medium uh, thickness and the circle is not particularly round. Uh, in this area, you can see the wash, the gradient between the blue and the purple. Um, he just, his, the variety goes on and on. The next one here, um, we have the strong red at the bottom and the two different shades of blue and kind of a dirty wash surrounding them. Here is kind of a medium pressure line in the black. It looks like the blue was reinforced he put two layers on that and the on the red he changed the color of red a little bit and here we got this circular scratching type of a uh, drawing and then you have the thick black feathered part there um it's just the variety is just goes on and on So confident in his colors, a lot of the abstract expressionism, which is the school he's totally supposedly in, um, only use the same colors. For example, Augustine um, said he didn't really know how to use green. He uses black and pink and gray. But uh, Deacon Corn, he's able to go from sharp green and reds, and, and then this one is totally reds and blacks. So he's, he his um, confidence colors is, sets him apart from most other painters. So he seems to have a hyper awareness of all the boundaries of the paintings 
And sometimes it seems like it's just a series of errors. He just keeps making mistake after mistake after mistake, and somehow it all fits together. And because he keeps the same frame of mind, it all works. But it, if you change something, it's all going to fall apart. I would guess that the red was done at the end to kind of lighten up to, to make that air part of the painting more exciting. It was a risky move to put that red spot in there because it could have ruined the picture. On this one, I, the thing that I think is exciting is that he he, he, at the bottom he has the two circles and um, there's a line from each one going to the top which is almost, he's setting up a, a um, kind of a um, motif or he's setting up a um, composition but um, it's mysterious to, uh, what this means it, uh, to me, it doesn't mean it's to me but for him he doesn't usually do that in a painting and so I find that um, another risk that he took that I think is great. Now at this part of the exhibit the wall notices start to write about how he questioned his abstract expressionism and he did this rider on a horse which was a total change for him and one of the I have to say for me one of the faults of the way he paints is when he paints a figure in his painting with his method, you, you can't really project yourself into the picture. In a conventional painting, you can kind of can project yourself as the horse or the rider, or you can go inside the picture. And because of this way that he paints, that I can't really do that with my mind very well. I can appreciate the colors and the shapes, and but I can't really enter the picture. At this point, he was questioning his abstract expressionism, and he's painted an abstract expressionist painter with all this paint splashed all over the place, and he's kind of wondering if he should abandon that uh, framework and try figurative work. So that ends the uh, exhibit here at Pepperdine University at the Wiseman Museum of Art. This was organized by the Crocker Museum and the Diebenkorn Foundation. I want to thank the gallery at Pepperdine and the guards at the gate. They were all very friendly and I had a wonderful time and I hope everybody can visit this exhibition.